Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody today. We are very happy to have you here for the uh, combined uh, CNC SIG and laser SIG and those who are also interested in epoxy. Um, we are uh, going to have a very interesting presentation this morning, Look, very much looking forward to it. I am recording, so if you don't want your picture on um, YouTube, then you probably should turn off your camera. Uh, but And when you're not speaking, of course, you might want to consider muting yourself. With that, I think I will turn it over to Travis and he can introduce the, the subject for us this morning. Hey, everybody. Um, you know, it's really kind of interesting the way this thing came about. About two years ago, there were a bunch of us who got together around the topic of epoxy. Seemed cool. We had a few really interesting projects talked about by uh, several of our members. And yet it was in the early stages of setting up our special interest groups. Prior to that, we really didn't have many special interest groups, but we we're taking a crack at a bunch of them. And now we've got quite a few. And it seems as though the epoxy that we've been seeing done has been in the CNC group. And that realization sort of popped into our minds when one day Rob on a show and tell showed us what he'll show us a little later here, um, a logo. And we just all stood back and said, how the heck did he do that? <laughs> and there was a, a bit of a buzz going around as a consequence of that one picture. And as we learned about his story, we learned what he was learning. And we also learned about his mentor, Shane, who is also on this call. Then we also realized that, well, you know, we've got other digital tools in the mix. I wonder, for instance, if you could do some of these techniques using laser. And it turns out that you can. And then Alan got excited about this and Alan leads our laser SIG. And so the idea was let's try to bring this whole epoxy notion to a focal focus point again and use what Rob has been experiencing and learning as kind of the jump off point. After this, it may be that it becomes just a topic that is occasionally visited in the laser SIG and the CNC SIG. It may be that it gets interest that we should actually have a, an epoxy SIG separate from this. But today is really just a fun ride down what Rob has been learning and with his mentor, Shane, and some of the incredible work he has done. And we'll have a little bit of a sidebar on what we've learned about doing it with a laser as well. So with that then, Rob, thank you in advance for uh, being willing to do this. And Shane, welcome to our community. He's visiting us from the LA area. Specifically where, Shane? Uh, Fullerton, California. Fullerton. So welcome, welcome. Take it away, Rob. Thank you guys. Okay, um, many of you know me. I've, I've worked with, with several of you and presented on one or two more uh, SIGs before. So I'm just gonna jump into this with, I put a little PowerPoint presentation together and uh, the uh, control between, I got three monitors, so the control between the various monitors may be a little shaky off and on, so be patient with us as we work through that. And uh, I'll go ahead and get started by starting with sharing my screen for my uh, presentation. All right, can you all see the, uh, can you all now see the presentation? Um, we can now, yes. All right. Yeah. And so uh, let me get to the controls for the presentation. So, oh, there we are. All right, so again, uh, Shane Peters, who, who said hi, he's, he's been my mentor on this thing and I'll explain a little bit about how I met him and so forth. And we're just gonna go through this presentation and discuss a couple things. So. I think one of the more important elements to understand is um, is how I ended up getting started. Uh, I'm not going to go into my woodworking background because I've shared some of that with some of you, and that's not important for this presentation. But but I get, ended up getting the multi uh, multicolor epoxy because I was using the CNC and I was trying to think of cool things to do with it, and I was trying to get ready for Christmas. And uh, so I use Instagram uh, a lot to go explore what other makers and people are doing in the community. And I ran across this page by uh, called Shane's Hardwood Store, uh, as I put in the previous screen. And I saw some videos and some things that were just 
impressing the living daylights out of me about cool things. And I had a nephew who liked the Broncos and I thought, oh man, it'd be really good if I could make a Broncos board similar to those. So you guys can see the example boards that, that Shane's got on here and you can see my Bronco board okay correctly, can't you? Yes, yep. yes we can. So, so let me give you an example of a couple of videos that I saw on, I'm gonna change sharing where I'm sharing my screen now. Uh, a couple examples of where I was, uh, what I was looking for, uh, what got me interested, I should say, in um, in uh, in this epoxy um, world. So let me see if I can share them okay. I will get, there's about three minutes worth of videos, one minute each. Can you see that? You can't see anything yet, right? No, I can't. So I'm going to hit share and get start because uh, I got to get to that screen. Um, up, 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 share screen. Okay, can you see something that says um, tools today or starts to say tools today? We can, yes. All right. So now the other thing on share, I don't know if you'll hear the audio part of this. I may have to do something different in a minute, but. That's not as important as what you're going to watch. That's the important part. So you can see this is a Tools Today logo. I want you to look at the detail on that bit. So the only thing we're missing is the uh, music, right? Yeah, I think so. I'll figure out how to put that on the next one, hopefully. I saw there was a selection at the bottom that says share sound. Oh, this is cool, the swirling technique. I think you have to click the share sound option when you share first share your screen. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that next time, Ed. So see the multiple layers he's laying down? Look at how he has to cut into the white after he's cut into the black. We'll talk about that later. I just realized I sent you the wrong uh, Tools Today video. I sent you the short version. I should have sent you the longer one. I'm sorry. Well, it works better for this purpose. OK. It All just right. showed more awesome. of the, uh, the So now internet. I'm going to go ahead and try to, uh, what do you see now? Your presentation. Good. That meant it came up on that window. So I'm not going to change it. I'm going to stop share, and then I'm going to do share again but I'm going to uh, click the sound this time. What did you see right there? Did you see the video? We still just see you. Oh, I, you're so lucky to just look at me. <laughs> hey, for folks who um, saw that last video and weren't quite sure what they were seeing, you were seeing a process that is sort of captured in the three names that I have seen in our email exchanges in preparing for this topic. The words have been multi-pore, multi-color, and multi-layer. Yeah. All of those ideas come together to produce these kinds of epoxy results. So as you see the next ones, think about those words, layer, color, and um, pore. So there are multiple times you have to do these things to get these results. And you can see in the videos a hint of how that's done. Right, and we'll be covering each of those processes uh, over, over the next hour. So here we go, let's see if this works. We're gonna share this. Do you see the frozen video? Yes. Yes. Okay, let's see if you see the sound this time. See how it magically uncovers itself, so to speak. And his notes yeah. on the side. <laughs> this would be what you would normally do uh, with the scraping and sanding and stuff. Yes. You can see how fine that uh, milling is it, as it pulls off those yellow tags. Slices them off.
Let me show just one more here and then we'll get on with the presentation because this next one to me is so impressive with the texture that Shane gets into this, into this logo. He does a lot of barbecue logos as you might have picked up. Can you see the video? Are you seeing the video? Yes. Yep. I want you to look at this ur, the way he actually gets that lined up. It's impressive. Amazing. Shane, I've got to say, it's beautiful work. Oh, thank you, guys. So anyway, that's how I got started as I started watching these Instagram videos and I saw this work and I said, man, who is this guy? This is really cool. So I reached out to Shane Burr via a direct message and said, hey, dude, I really like your stuff. I was wondering um, if you could help me understand. I think you're doing this and this. I think you're carving different times and I think you're actually carving into the resin. Is that what you're doing? He said, yeah. He says, yeah, it's not. He said, it's not really that really complicated. I said, well, it sure looks complicated to me. I said, uh, I'd really like to understand more. Would you be willing to spend some time and share it with me? He said, well, why don't you come up to my house and let's, let's talk and I'll show you what I'm doing. I said, well, where do you live? He said, Fullerton. I said, well, I was raised there, so I'm going to come up. And I said, don't say something if you don't mean it, Shane, because <laughs> you don't know me well enough because I'm going to be in your lap and you don't even realize it. Just ask other guys and I'll Woodworkers Association who I clung on to. And uh, <laughs> he said, no, I'm serious. Come on up. I'd love to show you. I said, okay, so I'll be there Saturday. And that was on Thursday. So he had two days notice. And I ended up coming up to his house on, on Saturday. Um, there was a guy from Laguna there trying to learn some stuff and work on his equipment at the same time. Spent the whole day, got to know Shane and his wife and what a wonderful guy he was. And ever since we've been really good friends and he's been openly sharing his experience. In fact, he shared it so much, he actually, that Broncos board you see there on the right is, I said, hey, I wanna make this Broncos board and I'm still trying to figure out how to get started on the, on the vectors and stuff. We're gonna talk about the process in a minute. I said, uh, would you happen to have a Broncos vector already? I said, I'll pay you for it, whatever you want. Just, I want to try to do this for my nephew for my own sake, I wanna try. He said, he said, no, you don't have to pay me for this one. He says, he says, do you already have a board you're going to put on? What size? I said, well, I haven't built the board yet. I'm still trying to figure it out. He said, I got an extra 11 by 17 walnut board. Why don't I just send it to you? So next day I get this walnut board along with the, the vectors. And he said, I've already laid it out on how you will pour it and everything in there. So that began my journey. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Shane and let him tell you how he got started in this, this area. Shane? Okay. okay. My, my, everyone can, everyone hear, me can okay? hear me okay? Yes. I'm getting a getting little, a little feedback. feedback. Let me see if I can, if fix, I can fix that. that. Um, okay. That might have been it. Everyone, everyone can hear me? Yep. Okay. So um, I'll try to make this as brief as possible. Um, Rob probably knows, but the rest of you don't. I'm not the... Uh, the um, you know, the type to sit on here and like lead a class or to, to really uh, teach something. It's, I'm an ice hockey referee. I, I, I go all over the world for world championships and I have a construction company. Um, in December of 17, I tore a rotator cuff on the ice in Anaheim uh, during a USC game and uh, needed, my, my surgeon told me I needed about 12 months, you know, not to be on the ice. Now, ice hockey is just my weekend thing. And two weeks a year, I travel overseas. So I thought, well, what am I going to do to keep myself busy so my wife doesn't want to kill me on the weekends? I know what I'll do. I'll make some cutting boards. So I had a uh, bench top jointer from Lowe's, uh, the little uh, Porter cable, and the DeWalt 13 inch uh, planer. And that, that is it. That's the, uh, oh, and, and I'm sorry, and then the DeWalt uh, uh, mobile table saw, like the tailgate one. So I was just making some boards and put it on Etsy and couldn't get going. And uh, it seemed like things were not moving. So I got this bright idea that I had just finished a table for my wife. See, I've always done woodworking, but I've never shared it, had a company, anything like that. I just 
did it for myself or my friends and family. So I said, well, I just finished this table for my wife. I, I turned down $8,000 for this table. It's a live edge redwood. If you go to shaneshardwood.com, it's the, it's the table on that site. Um, I said, I'll post it on Etsy. So people will see the table and say, wow, if he can make that table, his cutting boards must be nice. Well, the very next day, of course, you guessed it. My wife's table sold that I didn't tell her I listed on Etsy. So, and of course, I didn't know what Etsy was because a friend set up the site for me. So I told them put it for 5,000 because I don't want people to think I'm crazy, but no one should spend that kind of money on a mom and pop site. Well, I was wrong. Anyhow, the person who happened to buy that happened to be an adult film actress. Nobody panic. This is not going to get weird. It just, it's, it's Etsy. You know, you don't know who's going to buy your stuff. Anyhow, she received the table. She posted something. Now, all of a sudden, my Instagram that had 100 followers had a couple thousand followers and people started messaging me for woodworking stuff. That transitioned into me playing with uh, a router and some templates and uh, pouring epoxy into a single spot. From there, uh, uh, am, I, am I going too long or is everybody cool? Okay. Cool. Go okay. So um, from there, what I did was, um, it, it, this, is an, uh, this is weird, but uh, you know, all my inlays were like, you know, an epoxy pour, you know, because you're cutting it into wood with a wood border and then, you know, epoxy wood border and you could change up colors, but I always had that wood border in between. It was two in the morning one morning uh, a couple of years ago and I woke up and I said, you know, if I, if I let, if I just cut out the whole silhouette or an oval or something and let that harden and I come back in and cut what I want to cut, I could get, you know, and I do that multiple times, I could have epoxy to epoxy full color inlays and I don't see other people doing that. Now, if you were locked in a garage like your whole life or, or in a basement your whole life and you had never um, discovered picture frames and one day you were out there messing with stuff and you, you figured out how to make picture frames and you ran inside and said, hey, I invented picture frames. You know, you think you did because you've, you haven't been out in the world. That's kind of how this happened. I had not seen anybody doing this. I just figured I discovered epoxy to epoxy inlays. Now, for me, I, I, I did this, you know, um, in my own head and, and kind of, you know, figured out how to do it. Then I realized, wow, a lot of people have been doing this. I can do a lot of reading. And, and since then I've learned a lot more. Uh, but what really drew me to this was, um, um, Rob knows her name and I, I, I apologize for not knowing it, but it's that uh, Reva Wilkinson Art or something like that. The lady I tag you in Rob, she does this amazing epoxy work but it's all oceanscapes and landscapes. And that's kind of what drew me to epoxy. And then from there, this whole thing is just kind of spiraled where I went from those three tools I mentioned in my garage to a Laguna Swift, uh, Laguna laser showed up yesterday, a saw stop table saw. It, it, it's really just exploded. I've been very blessed and very fortunate that people really liked my stuff enough to make it that popular. Uh, barbecue teams now are constantly calling for big uh, table inlays and things like that. They want their logo on it for presentations and things like that. So it's been a, it's been a really fun, uh, fun journey. I'm looking forward to joining this organization for the San Diego Fine Woodworkers and uh, learning a lot more, especially about this laser that showed up yesterday because I know nothing about it. <laughs> is there a logo on your shirt there Shane yes uh Laguna has been very good to me uh they I'm not sure why but uh I, I, I met a person there and uh, uh started talking with them I have bought a bandsaw a, a four vice uh woodworking table you know the, the square ones that they used to use in the schools that have the four and you know, a one on each side um uh, you know then uh then the CNC and now this laser and they're constantly, if I need sandpaper or a shirt or really anything, a saw blades and things like that, these people just are so, so nice and so kind. I tag them in things and then they send me uh, items. So it's, it's very neat. I think it speaks well for the work that you do. Oh, thank you. All right. Rob, you wanna take it back? Rob, you're you. uh, Mike. I was talking to a muted mic. Okay, I'll go ahead. Can you see the uh, the monitor with the presentation on it yet? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to zip through a couple of these uh, these slides. Then uh, anybody has a question, feel free to ask. But basically, the process here is I'm going to go over the I'm going to go over the basic process to start out with. Now, as we go through the the basic process, um, there are a couple points where I'll try to say this. This can be done on a laser based on um, on Travis's experience. It's just how you set up some of the vectors and stuff to make them work right. 
So think about uh, just the overall process. And I, it's like about a six step process, just the over process. So I'm gonna start with each of the basic process steps without going into much detail. And then I've got a slide on the six steps that talks more detail about that, just so you know where we're going. <clears throat> so the first step is, is vector selection and setting up uh, that vector. That's the, that's, the, uh, that's the first thing you gotta do is not all vectors are created equal. And what you'll find is if you go out there and you, well, I'll talk more about it when I get there. The next part of it is actually determining the pore plan. And this is pretty important and we'll talk more about that uh, as we go through. Uh, you have to really understand how you're gonna sequence the colors and we'll go into a little bit of discussion about how you make those choices. Vectric is the software of choice by Shane and I. Uh, he uses VCarb, I use Aspire, but they, they work the same way. So if you're a Vectric user, uh, when I talk about things, uh, some things will make sense to you. If you're not a Vectric user, other softwares do this. It's just the uh, one of I use and it works the best for me. So I can't really talk about other types of software, but the concept is what we'll talk about. The next one is after you've, after you've determined your pore sequence, you actually have to start set up your tool pass for proper cutting of each separate color, which was, which was based on number one above vector selection and setup of those vectors. Th those vector selection and setup is, 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 uh, is one of the toughest parts actually, and uh, takes uh, sometimes hours and hours, other times uh, on a simple, uh, color metric, you can do it pretty quick, but it usually takes a, a while on my experience. And I think Shane would agree on that. In fact, he gave me a guy's name to go higher if I ever want to do one that's more complicated, just because that guy can get it started and then I can do the cleanup. Right, Shane? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Real, real quick, quick. Uh, I just I wanted just to wanted say, to say um, um, oh, I have oh, that, I have feedback, that feedback, feedback again. again. Hold on. Hold on. Was that, Was that, oh, let me mute. Okay, just for a second. Uh, I wanted to say, uh, just be because, uh, you know, three years ago, I had never, I, I didn't know what a CNC was. Still that machine to me, I'm using it for just basic, like a caveman. So I understand that. Please don't think that uh, I think I've got a handle on any of this stuff. I just happen to understand, um, you know, I've just figured out what I need to know and, and move on. And this morning already, I, I uh, messaged Travis and he shared something with me that I'm looking forward to seeing about how to do, you know, one thing on this, uh, the software, the, the, the light, um, uh, I forget what it's called. The, um, light burn. Light burn, light burn, light burn oh. software. So I pretty much just kind of, you know, find out what I need to know and go from there and just try to grow from that. But software, I'm very weak. Uh, computers, I'm very weak. And, and uh, I have a really tough time with a lot of this. I just kind of figured out my little, my little spot I work in. Hey, Rob, hey, Rob I, I, I'd like to make, make a small suggestion, suggestion, which is that uh, uh, Shane is been monitoring, monitoring the and, and answering questions. If, if we could keep doing that, that's really kind of working well. So uh, go ahead and plow forward, but Shane is uh, watching the chat and answering questions too, which is just a really neat way of uh, getting more information out of this session. So I encourage anybody who's out there with those questions, just to pop them in there and see if Shane can help you as we listen to Rob tell the story. Sorry, Rob, go, Rob, ahead. go ahead. No, that's really good because I haven't watched the chat at all. Awesome, Shane, thanks. I didn't know you had that in you. All right. Uh, I didn't mean I didn't know you knew about the tra chat area. So, okay, so the next, so we set up the tool pass. Again, we're gonna talk about these in detail. So don't worry that I'm skimming it. Uh, cut first tool path and pour the first resin color. Let the resin harden completely. And then you start cutting the remaining tool pass. And we're gonna get in the importance of letting the resin harden and cutting the remaining tool pass in order of setup, which relates to bullet two above, which was determining the pour sequence. That's why that becomes really uh, critical. The last thing that you do is you mill it flat and you finish the product, which is what you saw in those videos at the end where Shane has got his CNC uh, milling that, um, those, those cutting boards. Uh, I'm, I put a caution note here. This whole process is time consuming and takes a lot of patience. And I've worked with a lot of you guys and you have that patience, but some don't. And I'm, I get stretched on mine. It's like when we wa were watching Ed, uh, do his finishing process uh, uh, probably six months to a year ago where it looked like paint was drying as he went through each grade of, of, of finishing. And you know, some people said, well, if you really gotta have the patience to do that, I'll just put lacquer on it or something. So 
So it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. And this process is stretched out over days when you use multiple colors because it takes that long for your epoxy to dry. And we'll talk about types of epoxy and things like that in a minute. All right, so let's talk about the first one, vector selection and setup. So the vector design is critical and most purchased vectors uh, or vector transfers need work to allow the multi-layer design. Basic concept is you have to set up each element of your vector independently so you, you can pour in that vector. In other words, a lot of them you get, there's a run-on vector that, that, uh, that covers multiple areas, which really isn't a pour by itself. So you get into interferences and so forth. So you've got to set it up so that you can do each one individually. And in a little bit, I'm going to go, I'm going to show you an example of my Broncos board uh, and hopefully we'll get the screen sharing working right. And uh, I'll show you uh, exactly what I'm talking about there. Vectors have to be set up. Uh, I already said that from a, separately from each other. And a whole separate topic is how you can bring in a vector and actually use bitmap tracing. So you, if you don't have a vector, which most of them you won't have, a lot of my, my simple ones, I get off Etsy, I'll go pay a buck 50 or three bucks or five bucks for the basic vector. And then I modify it from there. So that helps. I'll show you an example of where I did that here in a second. So, um, so let me go into an example. Uh, well, let me first see here. Um, What's on my, uh, all right, let me. We see here, here. What you can't see my screen doing is I'm getting ready to open up a, do you, what do you see, the Broncos on there? Do we do, we do. Bronco? So let me cover that first, and then I'll cover how you could do a bitmap trace. So this is actually the file that Shane sent me out of the graciousness of his, of his heart. Um, and he actually sent it set up. So I, I want to point out, as I, zoom in on the Bronco here. I want to point out, he actually sent me one of those full board and I put it down in the corner. And a side funny story is when Shane looked at what I was going to do here, because his covered the whole middle of the board. And I said, well, I, I want to leave some room for them to cut on because you don't really want to cut on epoxy, that beautiful logo, uh, too much. Uh, I, I said, I'm going to just put it smaller down in the corner. Is that good? Shane he said, sure. So I showed him my epoxy board after it was done. He said, oh, so the guy's a left-handed cook, huh? I said, what? Yeah. He said, well, your, your logo's on the right side. That means he'll cut with his left hand on the left side. Uh, right-handed people want the logo on the left side. That just shows to show you experience. <laughs> I had no clue what he was talking about until he brought it up. He just laughed. <laughs> Remember that, Shane? Yeah. So anyway, so let me zoom in here on the, on the board real quick. But... Uh, as you can see, each of these vectors, can you guys pick out that each of these vectors are separated from each other? So they're carved separately. So I'm going to open up the tool pass, and those that are vector users may recognize it. If not, I'll try to explain it. So what we're doing here is we're setting up tool pass. So let me say the primary vector, we're going to talk about that in a minute. The dominant vector in this case is the horse's head. So let's see if I can pull up a... Um, picture. And I'll try to pull it into that screen so you can see it. Can you guys see the, the picture I just brought in real small? Yes. Yes. See, I'm going to blow it up as big as I can. All right. So that's the, that's the Bronco logo. And so if you look at this, you, you look at it and say, well, what's the dominant color? We're going to get into that discussion in a minute. You'd say, well, the white. White's the most. Well, no. In reality, the dominant color is this outline, this blue. You see how everything is blue? So when we get into setting up the pore selection, you'll see that Shane set this as the first pore. And because he picked up this as the first pore, let me put this as a minute. If I go in here and I click on these two here, and, and, and I hit, uh, let me preview that tool path, because I do it in the color I want. I'm going to show you that what happens is it cuts out that whole section, and now that's the section you're going to, oops. That's the section you're going to cut. 
out blue and you're going to let it you're going to let it sit for a day all right then the next section you have to figure out is what's the next section and shane said well white is the next section based on what his his choices were and so he set up the next section here uh i'm editing it because in reality to make it show up i've got to make it deeper than the previous selection which was 0.15 so i'm going to make this start at 0.15 i may get a message that's going through and then carve down and i'm doing this only to show you that uh what it's going to look like so we do this and we preview preview this one you'll see now that's the white part of this of this epoxy pour and then the last part is the orange and if you go in and you set that up to start at 0.151, I think it was 0.151, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.15, 0.
matched it. And then I just made sure I laid the text with spacing and everything and size over the one underneath it close enough. When I got done, I now have a logo that is, I can save it as SVG or a BPS file in Vectric, but it'll be an SVG or EPS. So you can bring in the light burn or anything else if you wanted um, that I could lay on whatever project I'm doing. And in this case, I'm laying it on a cribbage board because the firemen like cribbage boards and Mike McElhaney has invited me to be a volunteer to help with all that stuff. So, um, so anyway, there's an example of, uh, of how you could bring a logo in if you had a Broncos logo or something you wanted to bring in. All right, uh, I shared the example of the color selection on the Broncos board, so I'll go to the next slide. Okay, so now this, that other slide kind of laid out what I was talking about, determine the pour plan. You first need to establish which color will be the predominant color. And that's not always, I would say, obvious to most of us. Uh, Shane jumps on it right away and we'll ask him some of his experience in this case. Another example would be um, in a shark board that I, uh, that I recently built. Uh, when I started wanting to build the shark, I'll, I'll jump up to give you an example of how it finally turned out. Let's see if I can bring that over there to the screen. Can you see that now? Can you see the shark? Yes, we see that. Yeah. All right. So it's got a bunch of holes through it because it's a cribbage board. But when and I'll I'll tell a little story if we have time on this. But the the predominant color uh, in talking with Shane and I it was it became more obvious in this case. This one was pretty easy for me. Was the black. So the black is all carved first and poured as one big pour like that blue was, and then the white gets carved into the black. Would you guys say that it generally tends to be the outside color? You start with the outside color and work your way in? Okay. Uh, it, in the beginning, it was definitely like that for me. And now I found that uh, sometimes coming in and laying over the black makes more sense. Um, see, if I was more comfortable with uh, the terms and, and, and all the stuff that we use with all the software, I would, I would try to describe it better, what I'm talking about. But there's times because of the way a V-bit is, uh, you know, just the natural size of the V bit. If that's, you know, if you were to cut that last, all those black lines last, that black line will be wider. Um, otherwise, you know, you're cutting in all the vectors around and, and uh, let me see if I can, I, I just did this here. Let me see if I can show you. Uh, sometimes fans of uh, these barbecue guys, they also would like a board. So I get the permission of the owner of the logo to make them a board. This one uh, doesn't look great yet. It's just straight off of the, um, CNC being flattened. So there's no sanding yet, no um, oil yet. You can see it'll be a much nicer color there when it when it's finished. But uh, what I mean is, if you looked at the first board I did and the last board I did, uh, I came in and cut some of these black vectors last, uh, again, recut them. So they're fatter, uh, just because of the, 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 the tool that I had to use. Um, uh, let me see here, there was one more. Oh yeah, and, and the nose too. If you, if you watch the video, you'll see that the nose, um, before I do the black pour, you can see there was old uh, white in there. So this gets poured early. And then I, do the, I did the black after. It got carved back out because I just didn't catch that I was carving out this. So when I come back in, these pieces are a little bit fatter. So the, the best thing to do is just to stick with one uh, way. If, if you're black or you're dominant or you're outside shade color, you know, because on the Broncos, it happens to be blue, but let's just say it's black. On the black, if you're going to, stick with, hey, I'm cutting that last. I should have cut all of the black very last uh, or, or the white very last. And I kind of mixed it up on this and I'm not real happy with how this nose is a little fatter. These pieces are a little bit fatter. Now, that being said, they're never gonna notice. You know what I mean? The, the, the guy, even though the guy that owns the logo won't notice, but it's just something that I noticed and, and picked up on. So I hope I didn't confuse the hell out of everyone. Just a quick okay. question, Shane. Uh -huh. If you do it right, should you ever have to pour the same color more than once? If you do it right, no. Okay. But okay. I don't always do it right. <laughs> and the, the reason I was asking is that when I, for instance, mix mica powders mm -hmm. or uh, ah. even the quantity of mica I put in, Good point. I'll get a different color. So yeah, I couldn't okay. necessarily get a red the same you, twice. You mentioned my notes that you see on the front. Yes. Um, those are my, 
I usually make a, a sticker on the side. Well, the first thing I do is you'd be surprised. It's probably just me because I'm ignorant and, and, and this is not my thing, but you know, I pull a board off of the CNC and maybe I'll cut my juice groove in the beginning. Well, my X, Y down. Oh, sorry. What am I doing? I'm, I'm, so my X, Y down here, I always keep it like lower left. You know, I cut my juice groove and maybe I bring the board in and I do something uh, to it or I take the board away because I have to do something else. And then I say, huh, when I put this back in, it's hard to tell here because I, because I do the final trim at the end, but there's less uh, border on the left and the right. And there's more border on the top. I'm sorry, the, the left and the bottom. And there's more border on the top and the right because yeah. I still have to make this final trim. If I was to accidentally take this board back out and make this my bottom left, this logo would be off inside the juice groove. So what I do is in the very beginning now, I just take a piece of tape and I put it on the left side. And then I, I know that, you know, I always do that to the right. And on the back of my boards, this is, yeah, this is already being cleaned up, but that's where I make all my notes in pencil right on the wood itself. Um, and uh, if I have to, if I know I'm gonna come back in and cut another color later, or if I'm worried I might have to because something gets messed up, I write down, hey, I did uh, three pumps of the West Systems uh, 105 and 206. And I added this much of this powder and this many drops of this liquid to achieve that color because I had that same thing happen where I had to go back and do something later and those two colors didn't match. So I just started the whole project over. Right, right. Oh, wow. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so now that you bring that up, uh, Travis, the other thing Shane talked to me about, he didn't come out here, but Shane told me it's critical that you, you make more than you're going to need because you'll never completely match the colors exactly in most yeah. cases. So he said he's had problems in the past where he made, he underestimated. And then when he had to come in and re -pour, it wasn't quite what he wanted. And now he had to cart everything out and start over because that's how he is. Right. He like if but, the Viking ended up with too little yellow and you had to mix some more. And so maybe the mustache was a different color yellow than the rest of the I would just start hair. over. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, the only reason I put this board up is this is an example I thought Shane uh, where the predominant color may or may not be obvious. So first of all, there's a white circle. I don't know if it, uh, was this part of the logo or whatever, but then you've got black, right? And then you've got bay, uh, the flesh tone. Amazing that you got that. And then you got the yellow. So initially, you know, the I would say you pour the white first, and then I would have poured the, at first I wasn't sure whether it was yellow or what I'd pour, though I figured it'd be black because it's got all these outlines. And then, of course, you'd say, well, is the yellow next? Well, the yellow has to go over the flesh. So I would have gone with the flesh next. Shane, go through your thought process about how you would lay that, something like that out. Well, if you, can, uh, if, if you can bring back that Broncos board and the vectors, when you had just the vectors showing for all the different uh, stuff, I can, I can explain kind of how there's another way to do this. Uh, when, I, when I do real big logo, when I say if I'm doing a small logo, uh, you know, eight inches or less. I don't really worry about the the, the epoxy waste. Um, that is, uh, you know, I should. You know, I know it's not it's not prudent just to to waste epoxy. But you could also, since I don't have control of the screen, but you could also um, instead of you know taking that outside vector. If this was a giant logo to go in the middle of a thirty inch board for a for a wall sign, you wouldn't want to pour all that blue and then come back in and just waste all that. Uh, blue that you just have to cut out and pour white. So what I would do is I'd highlight the orange vectors and I would throw another vector just inside an eighth of an inch. And then I would cut, and then I'd do the same to the white. And then I would cut from the blue to the inside of the orange, to the inside of the white, and I'd pour that blue. So the blue would be kind of fat, but then when I come back in and cut the original vectors for the orange, it would jump back over into that little bit of blue okay. and, and scrape out the, uh, the, the blue epoxy. And, and then I'd still have the nice, perfect uh, uh, cut there. So, so Shane, Shane, it's a, a way to not waste as much. I think, what you're, I think what you were saying is that rather than fill the entire void, what you do is you create an offset. So yes. if you have a small orange area, you might make it a little bit bigger and then cut it down later. Um, I'd make it smaller. I'd make that area smaller and let some pour come into that area and then yep cut it its normal size later, which okay. would come back into that color I poured. And so you limit how much epoxy you need, right? but you're doing that through using offsets and you've got your logic figured out. And on a big board, that's probably a big saving. Yeah, that's that's where I, the only time I would even consider that, even on this one, if you look at my the video, you can see like both times I've done it, 
I just pour the whole head, uh, the sandbar color, and then I come back in and cut everything. There was, you know, I could have avoided the eye. There was no need for me to pour this sandbar, then pour it black, and then pour it, you know, yeah, all but at an eighth colors. Of, it was a lot of wasted epoxy in, in yeah, these Yeah, but projects. at an eighth of an inch deep, it's just not that much epoxy you're going to use on that board. Yeah, this one I did a 0.15 on everything. Yeah, okay, great. Just a little over an eighth, so. All right, so that gets into that whole topic. Any questions on that? So it, it's it, that's the that is actually something you really got to think through the pour plan and how you're going to attack it. So once you've done that, then the next thing you do is you set up your tool pass. And I'm not going to get into a lot of detail there because we just kind of talked about that stuff in the previous slide with the Broncos board example. A couple key things after you got the color plan established. You figure out which ones you're going to cut first and when, and you set that up however you want in your board. As you can, as you saw with Shane, he actually laid it out so they had the blues together, and he started with the first pour cut, uh, tool path at the top, then the next one, then the next one in a logical sequence, which was easy for me to follow, uh, and so anybody else could follow it too. Or if he comes back a year from now and wants to do the same logo, he he knows how it's supposed to be running. Um, the V-carve toolpath, for those of us that went through the, the different presentations with like Howard Baum and others uh, for wood V-carve inlays, it's really basically the same concept. Instead of using, you know, the flat bottom and the stuff at the gap, but it's a concept that you use the V-carve toolpath 99.5% of the time. There might be times where you might use something else. Uh, I, I don't know if Shane's ever done that or not, but everything that we've talked about, V-carve toolpath, uh, is what we use. Um, the predominant color is the deepest. So as uh, Shane set up that Broncos board, the big color was 0.15. And then the rest of the colors were somewhere around 0.125 or what they needed to be uh, to make sure that you had enough opacity or whatever to cover up the other color. And I'll give you an example of that is the uh, mixing of the epoxy and so forth. That is a uh, uh, an important part is when you're mixing epoxy and you're trying to make sure it's the right color, it's got to be one, deep enough, and two, um, have the right texture um, in the epoxy. Let me show you a real quick example of that. So when I first made this, when I made this Broncos board, there are several things I'd, I'd, uh, I'd uh, emphasize in the future. Oops. I don't know how to control the screen properly, apparently. Oops. It's going through all kinds of pictures. Just a second. I a quick question. Uh, what's the need for making the second layer less deep than the first one? Um, the reason I do that is because I do a lot of engraving into end grain boards. And uh, when I do my first pour on an end grain board, usually I can flip the board over the next day and uh, it's come right through. Like it, you can see it coming right through the angle. It just wicks straight down through the board. So the reason I like to keep the first cut a 0.15 and then I can even a 0.14 or something a little bit less, uh, a little bit less, uh, a little bit more shallow is because that would leave that layer of epoxy there. And I don't have to worry about getting down to bare wood again and dealing with that bleed, trying to go through uh, other areas that, you know, it just looks for weak points. Epoxy, We'll just look for a weak point. It found a crack in a big river table that I did. It was about a 10 foot long river table. And I came out the next day and there was just epoxy all over, uh, all over the floor, not so where it was supposed to be. And it was dried and it was just a uh, redo the floors time. Your first seal, I mean, your first pour basically seals it. Uh, th that's kind of what I've evolved into doing is let that first pour kind of seal that whole silhouette of it and then just carve just a little bit uh, less deep the rest of the way to leave uh, epoxy is what I'm pouring onto instead of bare wood again. So I don't have to deal with, you deal with a lot less bubbles and everything. Yeah, so While we're on that topic. Um, yeah. I have seen when I've worked on face grains before that epoxy will wick into the, into oh, the grain. Have yeah. you had a problem? Have you? <laughs> Rob, Is tell them. Big me, topic, man, big topic. Big topic, we're gonna get into that in a minute. I'm gonna show you some examples. But, but it's the same kind of example you're talking about, Ed. Uh, it, it relates to what, uh, what uh, Shane was just saying is uh, you may even need to pre-coat with some other color besides the predominant color 
based on wicking and end grain and so forth. But I wanted to show you an example here of what we were talking about. So when Shane looked at this, the first thing he said is, hey, Rob, you know, you need to get some white drops to go in your white because he saw the translucency of the white showing the blue through it. You see what I'm saying? So one was thickness, but the other one was simply adding more pigmentation to the white. And, and I was wondering, how come it didn't turn out crystal white because it looked like it in my cup? And uh, that's what Ed shared with me. And you'll see on the shark, I didn't have that problem because I added in some, uh, some other pigment that helped make it not so opaque. Another example would be the eye. Uh, when I posted this on Instagram, uh, somebody said, hey, you know you're missing his eye. And I said, no, I'm not missing his eye. Just look real, real hard. You can barely see it. <laughs> but, but I knew I was. And so I would, if it was Ed and he was selling this, or if I was selling it, I would have gone back in and recarved right where this eye is, because that's supposed to be a bright orange like this. And it's not because the carving wasn't deep enough with the bit I was using. This gets back to the bit selection that Ed was talking about, uh, that um, Shane was talking about. Hey, Rob, if we come back around to that topic of having to come back and recarve on a flattened piece, I've got some good info for that later too. We don't have to do it right now, but just you can remind me, I've got some uh, info on, uh, I have, much That's experience great. on having to come back in because I, I flattened a piece and then realized, oh, I forgot the, uh, there's a small vector that never got cut. You know, there's a piece of yellow or a piece of white or something like that missing from here, um, you know, to come back in. So we can go over that stuff too on how to do that. Sounds good. So anyway, as you can see here, I've given the rest. So you start the predominant color, then you do the next colors. And the, 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 uh, the biggest, the bit normally used is a V bit. Most common V bits that I've used, and when I talked with Shane, was a 30 degree V bit. And then uh, we both used 15 and 18 degree V bits. And uh, you can get into get Shane's input if you want on cautions and stuff about breaking the bits or, or setting up the tool paths and so forth. I would suggest that with those, with those narrow bits, 18, 15, and 30, if you're going to go after this process, you have a, a one or two extra in the background and you don't want to have to go make a quick order. Uh, I haven't broken any of those yet, but they're real easy to break. Shane gave me I some have. stories. And uh, also, if you're not careful, just by, if it falls out of your hand onto the concrete or a hard surface, they're so so fragile, they'll, they'll break as soon as you start using them. So handle with care and be aware that You'll be, well, you'll want to be on the conservative side of your tool pass when you're setting up bits with that size. Any questions on this slide? I know I'm running out of time here. Uh, so Actually, you Rob, your... Rob, on that topic, because this is such a rich presentation and we have a chance to learn, I'd like to ask if anybody wants to drop off after an hour, please feel free to. But Rob, if you would just continue, because this is really great stuff. I don't want you to feel pressure um, this has been well thought through and we've got Shane. And so uh, I would like to encourage you to just keep going. Anybody who needs to drop off can drop off. All right. Well, let me also mention that uh, those who might be considering dropping off that Travis is planning to talk to us about laser applications on this too. So you might not want to miss that. I'm yeah, staying. Although that, that may be a motivation to leave. No, no. <laughs> so we, uh, I, I'm glad you brought that up, Ed. So I want to point out that we're going to get into Travis here in a little bit, but uh, you'll notice that I've got depths here of uh, 0 0.15, 0 0.125, and so forth. And Travis has been experimenting on his laser with less depth, and and it's been working pretty well. So be ready for be ready for that, and see the kind of depths he's using in a minute. With regard I, to bits, what's that? With regard to bits, uh, why use V bits? Why not use like say an end mill or something like that, like a really small end mill? Well, uh, I'll give you my interpretation then Shane can tell us uh, why he makes that choice. In my case, it's kind of like the same thing you do with um, V carving inlay with wood, right? Um, that, that V carve, that edge having a V on it helps uh, keep the definition nice and clean because it's less of an edge than say if you're having a straight down 90 degree end mill, number one. Number two, probably the more, the, the bigger reason is the, uh, 
the uh, amount of definition you can get with a V-bit is considerably more because of the angle. So that's why you saw I said 30 degrees, 15 degrees, 18 degrees, because on a lot of these logos, you want very, very thin, less than a 16th of an inch. Uh, so you start getting into 32nd inch end mills and stuff, the stability of those just don't work. So typically you use a V-bit, but remember you're using a V-bit carving path. So don't get that wrong. A V-bit carving path has the ability, um, let's see if I can call this up here. Just doing the edges. Of just doing the edges, yeah. So what I wanted to point out is when you open up a tool path, and if you're not familiar with a V carb, that's okay, because I'm not gonna get into the details. I'm just gonna, the concept I'll talk about. When you open up a, a, a V carb or a V bit tool path, there's two parts. One is the tool that handles the majority of it, uh, is primarily the edge of it. So if it can do the whole thing, it will, but that gets to take a long time and cause problems. But there's always a clearance uh, tool path, such as a 1 16th end mill I used here, because I wanted to get as much of it with an end mill as I could, but you could have used a 1 8th inch end mill to get most of this. And then it does most of the work. And then the V bit just does the edge, the more detail. See, it would be hard, for example, if you can see me pointing to this little corner here, a 16th uh, straight end mill won't be able to get in that corner and make that nice crisp edge. Yeah, right. I think the simple answer would be that any flat end mill has a radius. Right. And a V bit can get you to a sharp point. So if you want crisp detail around the edges, then at least your perimeter should be done with a V bit. Correct. Yeah, there's a clearance bit. I think that's what everybody was probably thinking about was why not use a clearing bit. But in fact, you use two. You use the V-bit for the outline and then the clearance bit for yes, all the, the main work. Cool. Exactly. All right. So then we go cut the first tool path for this is where I was going to get into the wicking thing that we're going to talk about. So first thing you need to do is I said defining moment. So you, you're going to pour your first color and you're really, really anxious to pour that first color. Let me tell you, you want to see what this cool thing is going to look like when you first do this. Well, you got to figure out if a pre-coat is required first. And what I mean by a pre-coat is a clear coat of epoxy that seals it up so that you don't get the wicking outside the car. And also so that uh, if you have an end grain board like Shane's talking about, it doesn't bleed through the board the pour with all your color. <laughs> in other words, you kind of put this in, let it, it's a thin coat, let it seal, and you might need a couple thin coats uh, to get this thing to seal properly. Uh, so let me give you an example of what happens when you don't, um, oops, all right. Let me give you an example of a couple things that happen if you don't realize, well, Shane had warned me about pre-coating, but um, I hadn't really, uh, thought I was going to have problems. So I was doing a surfboard with a, uh, a cribbage board that I showed you, that sharp cribbage board. And so I was starting to pour it. And that, that wood, it had, let me pull it over here. It had all kinds of um, cracks and it was porous and it was spalted that I was starting with. So you can see all the black I had to pour to cover the shark and the grid lines and text that I was trying to put in black uh, for the epoxy. Well, I think, can you see how the black is wicking from where I poured it? Can you see that? Yeah, I can see it. Imagine how much it actually absorbed in the wood, uh, if you will, uh, and I'm going to give you an example of that. If you can imagine how much it absorbed in the wood, uh, actually, is that a video? Yep. Yes. Video? Yes. So let me let me do my first cut on this board. And there's two ways to mill it flat. We'll talk about both at that last slide. One is to throw it through a planer, and I have this really nice uh, hammer. It's a Felder planer, a hammer planer. Uh, 16 inch wide. So it's got helical blades. So it's a nice one. Uh, DeWalt or any of them that have the nice sharp blades will do it. Although the way Shane does it gives you a, 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 a even better finish. So I've shifted back to that. And I'll give you an example why I didn't use that if we have time for that story later. But uh, so here's the board going into my, I'm doing that milling part now. 
And I'm anxious to see it, but I'm scared to death because I saw all of that wicking and I'd heard stories from Shane before. And so I'm putting it through my point, my uh, planer. And do you see what I see? Yep. Oh yeah. Not Ugly. happy days. Ugly. So, so that was very disappointing. And, uh, and in fact, I thought, well, um, maybe I can do, just take a little more off and get lucky. Um, so here's the next, here's the next pass. Oh, that's not it. I thought that was a movie. Just a second. Yeah, you got nothing to lose at this point, too. Yeah. <laughs> just exactly. shaving it down. Oh, that's, that's harsh, man. <laughs> oh, it's, but he's it's, right. Uh, so one was the shark going into the planer. The one was supposed to be coming out. Let's see which one this is. Uh, this is going in, too, it looks like. Unfortunately, my computer isn't working real crisply right now. All right. Well, let me show you the end result after I got done with the planer. Yeah, I imagine another problem, too, is you're limited by how much depth you can take off with the V-carve. You're going to lose definition on your edges. Yeah, exactly, exactly right, Dan. So, um, so this is where I ended up. So I started up over again, and I started the carving. Uh, and I, I showed you. Um, so, so my first one is I lay the black, and the, what I did was I pre-coated this whole thing, not just the where I was going to carve because it was so rampant. Uh, Shane had suggested just pre-coat the whole thing, so I did, and uh, then I poured. And when I poured, I'm going to jump one case. I still saw a little wicking, and I was scared to death of what it was going to look like. And you can see the wicking here. Can you see that on the edges here? Yep. And I'm going, oh, my goodness, what's going to happen with this board? Now, now it's two pours. Of course, the, the black epoxy is <laughs> pretty cool, just like that. But I was worried about what it would end up looking like. This was my first cut, and then um, you know, I did the first cut, poured the black, and then this was me carving in for the white. And you'll see the definition in my eye still isn't enough. And I'll look forward to Shane's uh, hints on how to make that better. Even at the end, it wasn't quite what I would have liked to have seen. But, um, but the end result is that by recleaning and by recoating, although it didn't end up perfect, you can see that by the time I did the sanding and everything else, although there's wicking, it kind of blends in with the rest of the board. And because it's a shark that's in the water, I use that as an excuse for, for, uh, <laughs> you just look at the Perfect. water going by. Artistic effect, brush strokes. Yeah, exactly. It's wet. <laughs> so, so there was still wicking, but nothing like, nothing like, um, in the end, the board turned out like this. And it was nothing like, um, what was, uh, the original problem by pre-coding. Now, I made a couple mistakes in the pre-coding that I thought I would bring up. One of the mistakes was I was anxious as heck to see what this looked like. And so I pre-coded it, but then I didn't wait. I asked Shane, I said, hey, Shane, how long do you wait after the pre-code? He says, well, I normally let it wait overnight and dry. I said, I don't want to wait that long. He said, well, go ahead and do it when it's not dry. I said, I've been dying to know what happens. I, I, I'd love to see you do it. <laughs> I've been wanting to know what would happen. Why don't you do it? I said, yeah, you'll learn at my expense, huh? He said, well, I've got my own experiences. So, <laughs> and so if I had waited for it to dry, I think it would have been, I think the wicking would have still been less. Okay. Okay. Right. Well, have either of you considered trying uh, shellac or something to seal it as opposed to resin? I did not. I do. So many of my products are uh, charcuterie boards or cutting boards. So I like to just make sure everything I'm using is just completely food safe and not have to worry about like, you know, many times I've wanted to just get some lacquer spray in a can and, and, and use that to seal. But then I'm like, well, then some family's going to get sick if they put food on here and try to eat it possibly. I, I don't know for sure, but I just always try to use the food safe stuff. So well, shellac, that, shellac is just, food safe. Uh, shellac is what they use to coat M&Ms. Oh, Sorry, I was thinking of like a uh, polyurethane or something like that is what you meant. No, nope, that's good input, uh, Ed. So no, we haven't tried that. So if you will try that and let us know how it turned yeah. out, I'll use Shane's excuse. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Um, anyway, so let the first color dry adequately. And uh, Shane, did you have anything else you want to say about letting well, the first color just dry? Just your last note there. It says this is a time-consuming process. That's the the main thing. Uh, I'm 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 I was a lot more impatient before I started this three years ago. Uh, I'm a lot more patient now because of just figuring out that like you can't really rush this. So I let people know from the very beginning. Um, hey, uh, I'm going to need from a week to four weeks to complete your board once the board's built. Like once I have the board built and, re and ready to, to work on, I, could, I, I might need a week to up to four weeks. And everyone's been cool with that. I mean, these people, um, these guys, there's a lot of pride that goes into a lot of the people who want these things there. If you saw the, the, the two pictures that Rob shared in the beginning where it had my, uh, a couple of my boards on the left with the Minnesota and then uh, his board on the right, uh, one of those says Donna's Kitchen. Well, that was just some guy that called me and said, hey, you know, my 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 mother is really old. I want to, you know, I have her signature. Is there a way you could take her signature and put it into, you know, into a board? So one thing I was going to share anyhow is like even with Rob Shark, if he wanted to avoid all that bleed, one other thing he could have done is just put a, a big uh, white oval uh, first or clear, white, clear, whatever, some kind of light color because those those lighter woods, uh, they wick the the dark colors really really bad. So if he wanted to pour an oval first and then come back in and cut his black shark and then come back in and cut the white inside the shark, that would have killed all the bleed issues for sure. So for that one you saw that that he put up earlier, Donna's kitchen, I just put an oval around her signature and then added the word kitchen, and, and they were real happy with that. So so uh, I'm, I'm sorry. And these people, uh, I was talking about the pride for these people. Most people won't give you a hard time about the the, the timeline. Uh, they're paying between uh, these boards sell that I do between like you know, 200 and 1500 dollars a piece. So they understand, you know, this isn't something they're just going to run into Walmart and pick up. So the, the the main thing I can stress is just do not try to hurry. Don't try to rush. If you knew how many times I've had to start projects over on the last tool path cut because I forgot that I changed my origin for some stupid thing I was doing to. Uh, you know, uh, origin number nine, which has a different X, Y, zero. And then I ran a board back outside to do one thing really quick. And I, and I start carving, you know, where I'm not supposed to, uh, I used to have hair, a full head of hair. It's just been ripped out. So you just gotta, <laughs> you know, take it slow. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you want to say something about wicking in here, Travis at all? Uh, let me just show something real quickly. Um, let me spotlight that particular device here. Uh, could you unspotlight for just a second? Oh, stop share. Got it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay, so I just want to show you. Yeah, this is done with. Um, this is done with laser. I wanted to show you the wicking that you could see towards. Uh, it's not. Look at the antenna there. You see the antenna at the top of that one yeah, tower. You, do that. you can see the, the wicking on either side. And then here, I want you to notice this one was pre-coated. Look at the antenna on there. Okay. I put very little mica in this. I like the way the grain shows through the epoxy there. But if you go along this, by the way, this is an Austin skyline. Uh, you can see that there's a very crisp edge to all of this pour. And the reason for that, although the white would not have jumped out in the wick as much as the black did. Um, it is really crisp. You can just look at it in real life and see that the detail is there where the edges are precisely defined and there's no wicking going on. And that was due to the pre-coating. So uh, I'm, I'm personally on a journey to get away from the pre-coat, which is, um, which is, um, we should be bouncing back to me here. Can you guys see me now? Yep. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to get away from the kind of- What did you pre-coat with? That's exactly what I was going to get to is um, I used epoxy because that's what is the most obvious thing, but wow, waiting. And then what I use to actually spread the epoxy, it's, it's shot. And so I'm looking into alternatives that people are using out there. Some things I've read are people have used PVA glue, just regular, you know, Elmer's glue diluted with water. Uh, there are people I've read who've used shellac. I don't yet know what I'm going to do, but I don't have, well, you guys can probably guess. I don't have a lot of patience. <laughs> Consequently, I need something that's going to dry quickly to do the sealing. And then I can go ahead and move forward with, with my epoxy pouring. But uh, that seepage 
is really, it can really destroy a piece. And I think when Rob showed me his first shark is when I just saw how stark it can be, especially with the contrast you had there, Rob, between the black and um, the surrounding wood. So it's a really important uh, feature to get a handle on in this. I used epoxy. Later on, I'll be showing you something where Again, I used epoxy and had different effect, but epoxy works, no two ways about it, but it also takes um, time for it to harden. And then also there's the whole notion that if you have fine detail, and I had this on one of mine, if you have fine detail, like I have a, I have a, a uh, castle where you have just a very fine detail around the top of the castle and the epoxy clear actually occupies some of that space. And so the eventual pour that I went in on top of it would need to have been cut again in order to get rid of that clear epoxy. And I didn't wanna to have to cut again. I just wanted the epoxy to seep in and seal the edges. And I wanted to put my color epoxy on top of that. And so they're just, they're just issues with um, epoxy. I suppose I could try a really runny epoxy. Mm -hmm. I haven't done that. The most runny epoxy I have is called tabletop. Uh, it's fairly it's fairly low viscosity and so it flows pretty well but it's still in tight spots uh, gathers and it fills the void with clear which is what I want for the ceiling but it gets in the way of whatever my next color is Travis. so anyhow I just wanted to share that with you and I'll show you a little bit more about what can be done with the laser the things I just showed you were done on a laser uh, Travis have you looked at any UV curable um epoxies or no things, i haven't those... and i have some so i should give that a shot yeah that's those a good idea cure quicker yeah yeah you just put a little uv light on it and zappo it's hard that's a good idea right. i'll give it a shot hey travis i've had um luck on, on my bowls of diluting the epoxy with uh acetone mm -hmm. so you mix 50 50 acetone epoxy okay. it dilutes it and it fills in the pores of the wood but it doesn't fill in your void that you've that's that you try to work with too. Because I was looking for a really lower viscosity than what I've had. What did you use then to apply the the um, epoxy? Although if it was bowls, I don't know, just smear it, it around or? No, it, uh, I use a small painter's brush Okay, and that then you what get you from Hobby Lobby. And then was it disposable or did you just? Yes. Okay, that's Yeah, good. so you buy a pack, you know, you buy a throwaway pack for like $4 and you just use the thinned epoxy to seal the pores in, yeah. uh, to seal the area that you have cut around in. Okay. Because we do the same thing on bowls too. Okay, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give both of those a try. The UV curable epoxy and also dilute uh, 50, 50 with the uh, acetone. Yes, Alan. I, I use the I just use spray shellac, rattle can shellac. When I do when I paint my when I do Baltic birch and I paint it, you know, I'll mask it and then paint it for after I. Uh, after I etch it so I can have a black uh, letters on a white board or whatever. And uh, I just spray it with shellac first and then I spray it with whatever color paint I want. So I can't imagine that it wouldn't work the same way with epoxy. Okay, I'll add that to my list of things to try. Thank you. Yeah, and shellac, uh, you can get a couple of coats on and dry in, in 45 minutes. Thank you guys, appreciate that. Go ahead, Rob. All right, uh, let's see what I can control. My computer just did a big hiccup and we'll see what happens here. I'll have to find all my screens that I previously set up. Um, can, you, can you hear me? We can, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, it's not your problem. It, uh, my computer's been acting up. So let's see if I can get back to where I was. Uh, do you see that? What do you see? Black screen. Just your name and Jim. Right, name. It'll take me a minute to get this all rearranged, but not too long. Hope my mouse isn't working. Actually, while while you're doing that, uh, why don't we, Shane? I had asked a question in the chat, and um, oh. maybe this would be a good chance for you to just share with everybody. What epoxy do you use? Not in terms of brand or whatever, although that might be interesting, but the viscosity of various types from tabletop to, you know, there are just different flows that happen uh, at different viscosities. And what do you use for these projects? Okay, so I've only worked with, well, I shouldn't say I've only worked, with, I've, I've worked with several different kinds of epoxy. And remember, I'm gonna be saying all this from a, I consider myself 
an extreme novice in all this. I understand that that, that my logo work is, is very nice. I, I get that. But as far as like even Rob talking about the temperature in the room, like I wish I thought about that stuff. I, I really wish I did. I know it's important. I understand it's important. Uh, he talks about the chip load on uh, my tool path, you know, uh, and I, and I love Rob, like, I, and, I, and I respect all this info. And I wish I thought about things like that more because I understand I'm being very wasteful and uh, probably the machine not running as, as efficient as it could. But for, for epoxy, like when you say get the correct uh, viscosity, what I've done is when, when I do um, uh, river tables or anything like that, that are gigantic, some stuff I can't even work on here at the house. I've got a, 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 one of my offices has a, a warehouse that I just will sometimes use that for, for the big stuff. Uh, I use an, a thing called Ecopoxy. I just don't use that on my Instagram or post about it on my Instagram at all, only because West Systems, I've been lucky enough where I made them something in the beginning and reached out to them and said, hey, I, I, you know, I love this epoxy. I want to make you guys a sign with your, you know, with your logo in it. I understand you guys are an epoxy company, so you don't need me to do stuff for epoxy for you, but I'd, I'd like to make you a sign. They thought that was a great idea. I sent them one. And they sent me a bunch of product. And since then, I can pretty much just kind of call them and um, they give me a, a, a you know, uh, they'll either just send me something or I'll get a, a nice discount. So I use West Systems mainly because of that. And I don't talk about Ecopoxy on Instagram because West Systems is so good to me. But for thicker pours or for pours I need more time on, like uh, a river table, especially like if I take an oak slab and it's got just bug holes and all this stuff that's going to take a while for that epoxy to get into. I use Ecopoxy or an, like an extreme slow cure because you want a lot of time for those bubbles to escape or you're just going to have all kinds of issues. And um, uh, uh, I, I like the 206 is the slow hardener from epoxy. That's the one I go to all the time. Rob mentioned I use fast and I will use fast for very small things. Like when I, when I just redid just this half moon and these little half moons here in the nose, I just use the fast epoxy on that because... Um, I knew I wasn't going very deep. I knew I wasn't going to have bubble issues, all those kind of things. I didn't need to worry about it, but really a slow cure and, and uh, as, as watery as possible, if you're going to need a lot of time. And then uh, the regular 205, which is the fast hardener is fine. If, it, if, you, if it's not going to be, a, a, you know, soaking and, and creating bubbles. Yeah. So just so everybody knows, when it comes to uh, epoxy, some of the things that were described there, which are variables you can include in your decision process are viscosity. How thick or thin is the pore? Uh, in other words, does it move like molasses or does it move like alcohol? Um, there is the cure time. So how much time do you have for it to set up? That is to say, is it good? Do you have like 25 minutes before it gets hard and you, it's not going to flow anymore? Or do you have hours? Uh, the, the whole notion of, um, let's see, there's the viscosity, there's the cure time. Oh, and then the temperature. Uh, you can get temp, you can get epoxies that you can actually pour at different temperatures. The range that Rob was talking about is really important because if you don't have the right um, temperature, the chemical reaction won't work quite as it should. And you might end up with permanently tacky result or never fully hardening. And so uh, maybe at some point in the future, if people are interested, we can actually just have a talk on epoxy, the different types of epoxy um, and uh, how to work with it in order to do things such as we're discussing today. But uh, I, I was just curious to hear, I, I, what I really took away from what Shane said is he's ex extremely good at bartering uh, with brands. He gets all yes. sorts of great things from Laguna. He gets things from West Systems. <laughs> Tools today is a much needed one. You want to build them something because those okay. bits are very expensive. <laughs> Biggest lesson from this uh, talk. Rob, why don't you go ahead and take it back? All right. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, but no picture. All right, I'm trying to find my Zoom screen because it disappeared and all that stuff to give me to do a share screen. So with three monitors, who knows where it's ended up? Um, let's see here. Um, alt tab might help. Yeah, let me try alt tab. It's a well, I'm complicated. It hiccups so bad that I, actually it's it's not letting me use my mouse, so I have to use my trackpad, which creates a problem. Um, let's see. I, 
I can't seem to get it to share my screen. That, let me shut minimize all the other screens to see if it pops up. Sorry for this, gents, but. Uh, have you done it. share screen yet? I don't even have the controls for Zoom. It's it stopped, all the controls disappeared. Wow. So I can see your I can see your picture now. So let's see if I can do something. Exit minimize video. Okay, I'm back. Uh, all right. All right. So please ask host to give you permission. Okay. But um, I've got to pull up, I've now got to pull up that uh, presentation again. Okay. So you can't you can't share screen right now? I, I, I don't know here right this second. When I hit a minute ago, it said, please ask host. Let me, let me try again. All right, so now it's letting me choose one. So we'll click this and hit share. Do you see? Start We're there. Oh, yes, we see yes, we've got it. We see your file manager. All right, good. So then I'm gonna call up my PowerPoint here because we're getting towards the end of that. See what screen it happens to open up in. All right. Presentation. We are still seeing your file manager. Yeah, PowerPoint's opening up on another screen right now. Trying to get to the right slide so we don't repeat a bunch of stuff. <clears throat> I'm going to pull the screen over there once I get to the right spot. While Rob is working on that, I might mention uh, you guys were just talking about Ecopoxy. Uh, at the next general meeting, we're going to be announcing a new sponsor for the SDFWA, who's a company called American Worn Slabs. This is a guy that uh, has opened a storefront down at uh, Makatory, just down the street from the shop that some of you have been to. And uh, his primary product line is Ecopoxy. And he's going to be offering us a 10% discount on all Ecopoxy products, plus he'll pay the sales tax. So works out to about an 18% discount. So if you need a source for Ecopoxy, that's probably a logical place to go. Does that include the, the pigments and the, and the liquids? I mean, I'm sorry, the liquid pigment and the powders? It should, yes. Oh, that's great. Okay. Uh, but Shane, for members... Well, I'm joining, so I'll be a member. <laughs> Don't worry about that. I talked to Rob about that this morning. <laughs> okay, good. Thank All you, right, so I, I'm getting a message that said Zoom is not responding. Close the program or wait for program to respond. So uh, I'm going to quickly close and come right back. Okay, why don't you do that? And I'll go ahead and just do a very quick, this is the laser option for folks, okay? Right. All right, so uh, you're going to... Restart, is that right, Rob? Maybe he already did. Yeah, okay, okay. so let me, let me just do a two minute on... Um... Rob, can you stop sharing your screen? Uh, I actually have a button that says, force him to stop sharing and it doesn't work. So he... <laughs> his yeah, he's not on the list. Now he's just shown up again. Oh, now we've got David, okay. All right, so while he's doing that, let me just give the two minute on um, the laser. Let me switch to my other phone. Okay, let me spotlight that. Okay, folks, so um, what I just wanted to show you folks was, here is a little test that I did. Um, what we have here is, a uh, a recess that was done with the laser that was, get this, 0 0.02 inches deep. This one is 0 0.04 inches deep. And this one was the 0 0.02. You guys can't begin to appreciate it, but it is just, I mean, it's trivial how deep it is. Done with a one pass etch 
So it was very quick, relatively speaking. On here, I, uh, you can really affect how much translucency there is with how much pigment you put in. But these pores were with the same amount of pigment. And you can see in this one right here, you can still look through the epoxy and see wood below. With more mica powder, I probably could have had it occluded, but look, this is 0 0.04 inches deep. And you can see that it is blocked. And my reason for having done this is I wanted to see whether or not those of us with lasers and maybe even the little auteurs could try this out by ourselves. And all you need is just the littlest of recess to do that. And with enough mica powder, or if you're using the uh, pigments, the one that occludes the pigment so it is not uh, see-through, you can actually get some pretty good results. Now, I ended up with, it's so shallow that I did a little bit of spillage. And so it's, it's not a, there's nothing to mill off or anything. You sand the surface after it is hardened, but uh, it's, you're dealing with very, um, not a lot of material. I mean, this is probably a few thimbles full of epoxy that went into doing this. Uh, just as a quick sidebar, I was curious about different finishes. So this is a LIBOR finish I put on top. This is shellac. And here we have some uh, polyurethane right here. Uh, so that was if you were doing just pores in very thin, shallow recesses. I then went on and I wanted to see if you could get uh, really clean lines if you just did side-by-side -side pores. So we're not doing multi-pores yet. These are just side-by-side. -side. And the gap that you see on the far left is a 0.05 inch gap. And those lines are very clear and very crisp. This did have the... Uh, sealer go in. So I did use <clears throat> epoxy to seal it. But on this side, I didn't put as much mica in. So you can actually still see through a little bit. Switching over to this side, I did put in more mica powder. And so it is therefore blocking all the way through. The gaps between the individual rectangles are um, specified at the bottom, but they're not that <laughs> important in this one. This is really for translucency. And I did seal with epoxy. Now come to this, this is the first and only multi-pore that I did. Um, the original depth of that oval was 0 0.04 inches, a single laser etch. And then using the same power settings I did for the wood etch, I didn't do a lot of tests to pull this off because I just did it yesterday, but I created the recess into which I was then able to pour a second color and I was able to then sand it and get that kind of tight multicolor pour. And again, the amount of epoxy on this is trivial because it is only 0.4 in the first instance, 0 0.04 inches deep in the first instance and 0 0.03 in the second instance. I have to let Rob in. He just texted me that apparently he's still outside. <laughs> Hey, I have a question for you, but maybe it's going to be better for me to ask it, you know, and, and not waste time uh, on this. Uh, uh, but I had read something about when I'm sanding on epoxies and they get real hot. That is when you could get into uh, when you're breathing that stuff in, uh, you know, and those epoxies get hot. You know, hey, make sure you have a mask on. Some, something along those lines I was reading. So my question is, and using the laser to go back in and burn epoxy. Have you read anything or is there any kind of worry at all about, even though epoxy is, uh, they say, you know, might be non-toxic or something like that, like uh, art resin is a, is a non-toxic a non -toxic epoxy that is, um, has better, viscos uh, better viscosity than like maybe West Systems takes a little longer to cure, but they say it's non-toxic. However, I'm not a scientist uh, so, at, at, by any stretch. I just wonder, is it okay to burn that stuff? And so if that... let, let me answer your question in that I have not yet completed my research. Um, I go to product safety material sheets. That's a government process that they use yeah. to say what happens if you burn things or they're vaporized. Like the MSDS or like a material safety data sheet? Exactly. That, that's okay. exactly what it is. Also, you can go to uh, published lists of what you should and 
shouldn't burn in a laser. And I've looked at several of those lists and I did not find epoxy on any of the lists as okay. etchable or not etchable. So it is something that we need to get clarified. But in terms of just the actual results, I was really impressed at how when we were looking at your work, we knew the importance of having that V-bit to be able to get tight angles, right? Mm -hmm. And with the laser, it's quite easy to go ahead and get tight angles and yeah. little detail. And frankly, you know, this epoxy stuff isn't cheap. I mean, we don't all have the deals that you do, Shane. Yeah. Um, and to, if, you can, if you can have uh, a void that is only four one hundredths of an inch deep and have it work for you, that's really going to take your epoxy a long way well, and trust me so if this if i can figure this out to where i can do these you know a 0 0.04 a point even 0 0.05 or 0 0.6 deep uh, basically cutting it in half and do all this with a laser uh, i'll be switching trust me <laughs> <laughs> well we, we don't know uh, we haven't as a community fleshed that out but just so you know shane we have a bunch of people with lasers and cnc but probably many more with lasers in this community and so I just wanted to be able to, in support of Alan, show that this could be done with the lasers as well as with the CNCs. Let's see if, um, Rob, are you back? Uh, can you hear me? We can yep. hear you. And see yep. you. I'm oh, back. Sideways. Now pull, I just had to re shut down my computer and pull it up. So I'm on the iPhone and I just pulled up my first screen. So that's a positive. And let's see if I can pull back the rest of the screen. Okay. So give me about 30 seconds or so more. Okay. And, and Rob, just in, just in, uh, at this point, now, we're an hour, then we're an hour and a half into it. Uh, we should probably uh, try to dance through the rest of it relatively quickly. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it's been way, way too long, but basically the parts that I wanted to, to cover for the rest of this is, um, is uh, the importance. I was trying to remember where we were. Uh, the importance of uh, waiting between each pour. We talked about the wicking, and then um, we talked about. Uh, let me. I've got my screen up here. If I can get to the right spot, just so I'm not forgetting something. Waiting between for dry. Oh, the bubbles. Did you guys talk about that while I was off? How just the, briefly. Just briefly. Did you want to talk about the, the criticality of making sure you get the bubbles out? You made sure that I was going to heat up. Hey guys, just so you know, I think we've made a friend in Shane when he's willing to put his cell phone into the chat window. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I was going to say, I just wanted to put that there in case people need to leave because we're running long. I, I'm not in the hugest hurry, except I've um, got to figure out how to lift the saw stop up by myself and, and load it into a new mobile base, which probably won't happen today. But uh, so I so I have time, but I'm always happy to help. I, I love to uh, help people just understand that, like, you know, I may be good at, you know, one part of this, but software and, and, and graphic files and things like that is not my strong suit. But I'm definitely uh, always available for questions about, you know, experience I've had and stuff like that. Cool. So, Rob, can you hear me? We can hear you. All right, so so I've got another message at the top says Zoom not responding. So who knows what's going on with my computer? Can you hear me? Yep. All right, so I'll keep talking. So the next one was the uh, cutting the remaining, making sure you let it dry and, and getting the bubbles out, which means as Shane told me about every 15 minutes for the first two hours, he goes out there and puts a torch or a heat, uh, heat gun on it. Uh, my experience with that is not to boil the uh, resin i've done that right all right and then the we're, last we're one not, we're not one seeing you. just so you know we're not seeing you rob but just keep talking okay uh, the next thing was uh the next thing on the the step process and you'll have the video so you can look at the step process anybody wants a microsoft the powerpoint let me know uh the next one is actually milling flat and finishing um and that that's a uh a lesson, it could be a lesson in itself. You can either use a um, planer uh, if it's got really sharp blades. I find that every once in a while when I use my planer, um, there might be a little chatter in the uh, resin, which is harder to sand out. So I'm filling uh, using a, a bit. I have a, a pretty hefty CNC and so does Shane. So we use a two and a half inch milling bit uh, and it, we got Laguna CNCs. So uh, we're able to do that at fast enough and 
uh, enough power to get that down. If you don't have that, like I said, you can use a, a, a planer or you can just plain sand it down. It just takes forever to sand it. One of the other Drum guys I follow are really good on, for this. Yeah. So, <laughs> but the key I wanted to get at is to get that crystal clear finish on your logo. Uh, Shane, uh, Shane told me I needed to sand up to at least a thousand and twelve hundred. And I said, well, you don't, you don't, you don't sand wood that high, Shane. He said, well, you do this. And so he told me to try it and it made a world of difference um, in the, the finish. So uh, I've been finishing mine up to about 1200. Typically I'm using a random, a, a, a Festool random orbital sander. And I just go through the grips till I get up to that high. And what I found is even my wood uh, just sparkles and is smooth by the time I get up there. It reminded me a lot of Ed's uh, lesson on how he kept polishing and polishing to get that cherry finish. Anything else on that anybody want to hear about? Can you still hear me? Yeah, we, I'm yep. just wondering where you find the patience. Sanding, my God, it just takes for freaking ever. I, I hate <laughs> sanding. I do, I do take mine up to about 4,000 and, uh, and, then, and then I'll polish after that. But it is just a, just a, 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 I, I just, I hate it. And I wish I could just trust someone to hire someone and have yeah. them do s some section of my work for me. But I just have this thing where I just uh, don't know how to um, delegate and I just have to do it myself because I don't, I don't trust anyone. Uh, just so you guys know, I don't know if you guys know Matt, uh, Matt's Woodworks. He's in LA. If you've ever heard of him, giant account on Instagram. If you just type in Matt's Woodworks, well, he has a, a YouTube video he just put out yesterday that goes through um, exactly what he uses to finish epoxy. So I have a feeling I'm gonna watch that video and I'm gonna change everything that I've been doing and do it how he's doing it because he takes them up to 8,000 and then hits it with a polisher after that. Um, I mean, his stuff just comes out looking like it was just born that way, just glass from heaven. Like you just, you, you know, it, it's really amazing. So I think the more time you put into sanding, you, you know, uh, the, the better it's just gonna be. Hey, has uh, anyone tried putting a orbital sander on a CNC machine? I haven't. Oh, that's um, interesting. <laughs> think, sounds, I mean, like a Doug, sounds like a Doug challenge. Well, Shane, Shane's making some good money on this, and he's got, he's got like 10 projects going at one time. If I'm, I'm lucky, thinking. 10. Right now, I think I have 37 things that I'm supposed to be working on. I don't know when I'm going to get to it. <laughs> Rob's going to come and help me. But I mean, I'm looking at this going, I mean, normally we're complaining about CNC and laser cutting or 3D printing, and it's the machine doing the work. Normally in this process, it's like the curing time is a lot of it, but then the sanding. Um, so yeah, so I was thinking at uh, get a second CNC and just put an orbital on it. It's a good idea. <laughs> I'll call a good one. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Doug, if you have an extra CNC, you can just put it in my garage. <laughs> <laughs> They're All not right, so, that expensive, so, especially for something like this. So, Doug, yeah, I, I did see on the Carbide 3D uh, forum where they had uh, taken, they had these bits that would fit into the router that had a little foam pad and some sandpaper underneath it. Wow. And you could do something with that. Just in case anybody wants to see, that's what he's talking about. Uh, yep. Oh, yeah. And then you have just oodles of different grits oh, of uh, pads that you can put on. And if you put it on the, the uh, collet of a CNC, I suppose you could run across the surface and back and forth and go do something better with your life. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Is there any issue with, I'm thinking wet and dry sandpaper for the higher grit, but then you're working on porous wood next to hard epoxy um and um you know if that is even uh suggestible well uh in answer to that question there is a guy uh he calls him kiwi woodworking works with epoxy i invited him to the meeting but he wasn't able to make it he does some exceptional he does the charcuterie boards and stuff that are mixed uh whole sections of epoxy and wood which are which is a whole nother topic uh, where half is wood, Chicago, half is wood and half is uh, epoxy mm -hmm. and so forth. And he talked to, in his Instagram uh, lately about how he started using a uh, wet sandpaper to, to, uh, to shine up his product. So it, it, it'd be worth looking at. 
What was his it, name? Kiwi Woodworking. Is I'll he the one that's in Ocean Oceanside? Yeah, he's the one. That's, well, it's in San Diego. He uses Makatori a lot. Okay. Hey, Rob, why don't we go ahead and spotlight you and have you just uh, finish up for us, okay? All right. Well, I'm, I'm, I don't have anything but my iPhone because the computer crashed on it again. I don't know what's going on. Oh, okay. But okay. I'll basically just end up with asking if there were any questions and if we want to follow up, we can. I've already taken up enough of your time. I had a couple other examples, but we're not going to share those and it's not important. But um, there are some other cool videos that Shane has on his Instagram that just shows things popping out. Um, so uh, I think the topic has been pretty well covered. Other topics that could branch out of this is, is, uh, is how to do the bitmap tracing for those that use Vectric and, and tricks and, and stuff to that. But um, I think this pretty much covered the overall product, uh, the old overall process. Okay. I would like to say thank you to uh, Shane Peters as our guest and, and thank you to Rob for you, uh, your presentation and, and thank you to Travis for the stuff that uh, you brought in on the lasers. I think altogether this has been an excellent session. Uh, I will be posting it the next day or two uh, to the forum and uh, invite you to come and take a look at it when you get a chance. So, uh, so I'm going to come back on. This is Alan. So, Shane, uh, for us laser guys, not the CNC guys, but because you already got that CNC stuff down, but I, you said you got a laser. If you want us, want some help, you oh. can uh, always hit, reach out to us. Be careful in, what you ask or what you say. Uh, I'll take you up on it. <laughs> I'm in Fallbrook, so it's not that far from you. <laughs> and, and Shane, you don't know this perhaps, but Alan does lead our laser special interest group. He's sort of the head of our community. So uh, there's a lot of expertise that he can put you in touch with if he doesn't know, and he knows most of it already. So you've got a great offer there. Yeah, today I plan on watching these, uh, you know, when the Laguna MX, uh, you know, when, you know the, then the light, the light, light burn. Um, light burn? Oh, sorry. The light burn software takes you to this uh, video tutorial where like, hey, very first one for an amateur, you know, first time setup. So uh, I'm gonna go through those today and just see what I can figure out about that software. Yep, it's, it's cool. really easy. That's what all of us use. Yep. That's a good resource. Oh, good.